Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm honored to welcome you to William G. McGowan Theater this afternoon. Whether you're here physically in the theater or joining us on our Facebook or YouTube channels. Before we hear from Kevin Levin, Levin. Before we hear from Kevin Levin about his new book, Searching for Black Confederates, The Civil War's Most Persistent Myth, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up here in the McGowan Theater. On Wednesday, September 25th at 7 p.m., we'll show the feature documentary film, A Towering Task, the story of the Peace Corps. The film tells the agency's story from its founding almost 60 years ago to today's Peace Corps volunteers. And on Thursday, October 3rd at noon, Sarah Milov will t be here to tell us about her new book, The Cigarette, A Political History. Check our website at archives.gov or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates. You'll also find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and you can find more information at archivesfoundation.org. A historian asks what really happened, and to find the answers to that question, a historian looks into the evidence, written documents, photographs, artifacts, preserved in archives, libraries, and historical collections. Sifting through that evidence, uncovering the facts, helping us separate myth from reality. Often the process is long or difficult, but the diligent researcher will be rewarded. Today we'll hear from Kevin about the results of his research and his quest to find out what really happened regarding black soldiers in the Confederate Army. Kevin is a historian and educator based in Boston. Over the past few years, he's worked extensively with teachers and students across the country to better understand the ongoing controversies surrounding Confederate monuments. He's led history workshops with a number of organizations, including the National Park Service, Ford's Theater, the Georgia Historical Society, and the Massachusetts Historical Society. He's the author of Remembering the Battle of the Crater, War as Murder, and editor of Interpreting the Civil War at Museums and Historic Sites. His writings have appeared in The Atlantic, Smithsonian Magazine, The Daily Beast, and The New York Times, and he has appeared as a guest on NPR, C-SPAN, and Al Jazeera. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kevin Lubin. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And thanks for being here. So I want to thank the National Archives for the invitation. Uh, it really is a, a great honor to be, to be able to speak here in the National Archives. I, I can't think of a better place to talk about American history than, than in the National Archives. So I probably don't need to remind anyone in this room that, especially over the last few years, Americans have been mired in a very emotional, very divisive debate about the Civil War, specifically through the issue of monuments and memorials. Uh, over the last few years, especially since the, the horrible murders in Charleston in June of 2015, you know, we've seen Confederate battle flags lowered from public spaces throughout mainly the South, and we've also seen a number of monuments and memorials uh, removed, vandalized. Um, there are a lot of very... Um, there are a lot of opinions about this issue, and people are wedded to their respective views, and it has led in many cases to just outright violence. It seems to me that at the root of this debate is the issue of how we remember to what extent we've come to terms uh, with the history of slavery and white supremacy in the United States. It's essentially what this discussion has been about. It certainly didn't start with the Dylan Roof murders in Charleston in 2015. That, this is a debate that goes back, uh, in many cases, to the day that these monuments and memorials were dedicated, uh, roughly 100 years ago. But it certainly has picked up pace, and certainly the largest number of Americans are paying attention only as a result of the events of the last few years. In addition to Charleston, of course, 
uh, there was the violent uh, white nationalist rally in Charlottesville in August of 2017, and that certainly has kept uh, this debate alive. So what I want to talk about, the book that I just finished, is in large part about this issue, this, this issue of how we remember our Civil War, how we remember Reconstruction, how we remember the history of slavery itself. Um, the book is called Searching for Black Confederates, and the, you can see, of course, the cover in front of you. I'm going to start with uh, the image on the cover of the book, because for many people, uh, this is the most important photograph in this debate about whether or not African Americans fought as soldiers in the Confederate Army. And for those people who are the most convinced that, in fact, these men served, and you'll hear numbers ranging anywhere between roughly 500 and 100,000. Right off the bat, that should cause you to worry some, that we can't narrow it down between 500 black Confederate soldiers and 100,000. But this photograph, for many people, is really all you need to see. It is, for many, sufficient evidence that black men fought. I mean, look at the photograph. What do you see in front of you? You see two men, both wearing Confederate uniforms, uh, one black, one white. Uh, they are also, of course, heavily armed. Anywhere you can place a weapon, it seems, that's, in fact, what they did. And when I look at this photograph, having looked at it now over the last 10 plus years, what I see, in fact, is an image of the master-slave relationship. In fact, what you're looking at, at least for the, in terms of the man on the right, a man by the name of Silas Chandler, uh, you're looking at an enslaved man. Right? Silas was born to the Chandler family in Virginia, um, he traveled with the family to West Point, Mississippi, as a lot of other uh, slave-owning families did in the 1830s and 40s to take advantage of King Cotton, as they called it. Um, and he grew up in the Chandler family. In the spring of 1861, as the Confederate armies were being organized, Andrew on the left, uh, in the spring, early summer of 1861, enlisted in the 44th Mississippi Infantry. And like a lot of other men from the slaveholding class, he took with him what he would have called a body servant, what I call in the book a camp slave, so that there is no confusion uh, about the legal status of these men. I'll come back to Silas in a second, but Silas represents in many respects the broad mobilization of African Americans by the Confederacy, right? Uh, the population of, of the of the South in 1860 is roughly 9 million. Roughly half is enslaved. Uh, the population of the United States or the North is roughly 18 million. So for the Confederacy to have any chance of winning its independence, it's going to have to mobilize as much of its enslaved population as possible. And in fact, that's what it did from the earliest uh, days of the war. It mobilized tens of thousands of enslaved men as impressed slaves. So you would have seen throughout the Confederacy, you would have seen thousands of enslaved men performing all kinds of roles. Uh, you would have seen them constructing earthworks throughout the Confederacy. Here you have an image from outside of Charleston, South Carolina, James Island. You can see, of course, uh, numerous enslaved men constructing earthworks. They would have been doing this kind of work throughout the Confederacy, throughout the war. They would have been uh, building and repairing rail lines. They would have been... Um, working at places like the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, Virginia, where they would have been uh, responsible for manufacturing munitions and other kinds of weapons for the Confederate war effort. So again, right from the beginning, slavery is central to the Confederate cause. It's right there at the center of it all. Without it, the Confederacy has no chance of winning its independence. Now, in addition to those tens of thousands of enslaved men, you also have people like Silas functioning as body servants, or again, what I call camp slaves. And there would have been thousands of body servants in the various Confederate armies operating uh, between 1861 and 1865. Uh, these men are, are they're located completely outside uh, 
the Confederate military hierarchy, they of course are legally bound uh, to their masters. So imagine plucking the master-slave relationship from the plantation and placing it in a military setting. That's essentially uh, what you have in the case of these body servants. And body servants like Silas would have done all kinds of things for their masters. They would have been responsible for cleaning, um, for serving as a messenger between camp and home in many cases. Uh, they would have been responsible for carrying things on long marches, making sure that the camp or the officer's um, personal possessions are organized. Uh, anything that the master needs to have done, camp slaves like Silas uh, were there to do it. And so again, I want you to imagine these, these enslaved men performing a wide range of roles, again, places like James Island, but also, again, in the army itself. The men I'm going to focus on mainly today are the body servants. That's what the book focuses uh, mainly on. And when you focus on these body servants, when you sort of begin to place these men with the Confederate army, you end up gaining a much richer understanding of the importance of slavery to the Confederate army. I want you to sort of imagine Robert E. Lee's army, for example, marching north in the summer of 1863, culminating in the Battle of Gettysburg in early July. Uh, Lee's army may have numbered somewhere around 75,000 men. Uh, there may have been as many as 10,000 enslaved men marching with that army. Uh, we usually think of these armies as armies of white men, but there would have been thousands of enslaved men uh, with the Confederate armies, as body servants, as, as well as impressed slaves doing any number of roles um, for the army, whether it's in camp, on the march, and even on the battlefield itself. And one of the things that I, I was interested in looking at in some detail in the book is, again, what happens when you place the master-slave relationship um, in, a, un, in an unknown context, right? I mean, on the plantation, if you will, uh, masters were able to set the terms of that relationship over time and reinforce that relationship, uh, usually through violent uh, measures when necessary. But what happens when both parties are unfamiliar with uh, the unknown of military life? And certainly Silas, uh, and I'll go back again just for a, a second, Silas and Andrew would have both, they would, neither party would have had any experience uh, going to war. I just want to say a few more things about this photograph since it is so iconic and so popular. Uh, it was likely taken in the spring, early summer of 1861 when Andrew went off to war. Um, it was taken, obviously, in a studio. The uniform that Silas is wearing on the right is perhaps a studio prop, although some of these camp slaves did, in fact, uh, wear uniforms. But what's, of course, interesting here is once you acknowledge that Silas was a slave, you begin to take on a different perception of this photograph. Uh, when I look at it now, I'm obviously looking at a slave and a Confederate soldier. And when you look at these weapons, of course, um, it also sort of forces you to take a slightly different perspective. Uh, Andrew was probably 17 years old. Silas is about seven, eight years older. So you've got a very young, bright-eyed Confederate youth going off to war. He's going to send this photograph home to his family back in West Point, Mississippi. So you have to imagine Andrew walking into this studio and seeing all these weapons arrayed uh, in front of him. And you have to imagine, at least this is what I imagine Andrew doing, just trying to fit in as many of these weapons as possible, right? In fact, I, I usually chuckle uh, when, I, when I see this photograph because I, I don't see two heavily armed soldiers. I see... Andrew trying to make an impression and going to the extremes in trying to make that impression. Um, it is unusual in that there is no other photograph where you see both men sitting side by side with weapons. This is the only one that I've ever seen. Most of them, of course, look something like this, or more commonly, as in this case, uh, of an Alabama officer with his camp slave, uh, Burrell. And you know, these men are present throughout the, throughout the war between 1861 uh, and 1865. Again, they perform any number of functions uh, for their master. But you also see this relationship stretch and contract 
in many cases. Uh, you find camp slaves like Burrell pushing for increased privileges. Uh, the, the, ability, the, uh, the ability to make extra money during free time. Um, and many of them earn a good deal of money. Some of them actually purchase their own uniforms uh, with the money they earn, and their owners, in fact, let them do this for any number of reasons. Um, but you also find the masters having to push back in many cases. Um, there are a number of accounts in the book where you've got masters having to is in one case, lay on 400 lashes uh, to a barebacked uh, camp slave who had stolen some food from the camp. Um, in some cases, you find that the camp slave stretches the relationship to the breaking point. They run off at some point during the war, leaving their masters wondering what they did wrong, why their, in, why their camp slave would want his, his freedom. Uh, there are a number of cases where they write letters over the course of weeks wondering what happened and if they'll ever come back. So these relationships sort of stretch and contract over the course of the war. What they don't serve as at any point during the war up until the very end is as soldiers. In fact, one of the things that's so striking once you delve into uh, the primary source material is that no one in the Confederacy, as far as I can tell, was under the impression that at any point any of these men was functioning as a soldier. In fact, there are numerous accounts in northern newspapers, especially during the 1862 Peninsula Campaign outside of Richmond, where they are reporting that the Confederacy is in fact using large numbers of black men as soldiers in the army. Likely what they are observing are camp slaves and other impressed slaves doing all kinds of uh, jobs you know, in camp all, you know, on the front line, uh, but they were not, uh, at least as far as real Confederates were concerned, functioning as soldiers. In fact, when Confederates hear about this, they push back hard. They, they, they actually feel insulted that they are being told, that, that there are these rumors out there uh, that, in fact, the Confederacy is um, utilizing black men as soldiers. This is bizarre. Um, this, is, this goes against their own understanding of Southern honor, uh, to be accused of such uh, a heinous thing. This begins to change in 1864, very gradually. Uh, in early 1864, the man on the left, General Patrick Claiborne, a division commander in the Army of Tennessee, a recent, a recent arrival from Ireland, um, shares the idea with his staff. He, he sort of broaches the idea of enlisting slaves as soldiers in exchange for their freedom. He shares this with his staff. A few of them are lukewarm. Uh, a number of them are against this right from the outset. In fact, one of them sends a notice to President Jefferson Davis in Richmond, notifying Davis that this is being discussed, and Jefferson Davis immediately orders Claiborne to stop talking about it. Cease discussion of enlisting slaves as soldiers. Within a few months, the cat is out of the bag. Confederates throughout the nation are debating whether or not to enlist slaves as soldiers. They're debating it in the army itself, in the Confederate government, and throughout the home front. And people are very, they're very clear about their positions. Uh, they're very steadfast in their positions. This is a very emotional, divisive debate, in part because it raises the very question of what the Confederacy is fighting for. In fact, one of the best examples I'll share with you is ha from Hal Cobb, and he spoke for many during this, this debate throughout 64 and early 1865. Hal Cobb said, the moment you resort to Negro soldiers, your white soldiers will be lost to you. The day you make soldiers of them is the beginning of the end of the revolution. If slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. They won't make soldiers. As a class, they are wanting in every qualification of a soldier. So for many Confederates, and even those who come out in support of enlistment, they are very clear. They, they understand that this, is, this has the potential to undercut the very purpose of the Confederacy, the very cornerstone, to use Vice President Alexander Stevens's uh, reference. Uh, that white supremacy and slavery 
is the very foundation of the Confederacy, enlisting black men as soldiers, turning camp slaves like Silas, camp slaves like Burrell, whatever they had done in camp, on the march, perhaps even on the battlefield at one point or another, whatever they had done had not risen to the level of a soldier, right? If they had, if black men were already serving as soldiers, then why would they have the debate at all? That's one question that I'm constantly left with when talking to people who are convinced uh, that black men fought as soldiers throughout uh, the Civil War. In fact, in 10 plus years of research, I have not once come across a letter, diary entry, editorial, there were hundreds of editorials published uh, in Confederate newspapers during this period. Not once did I ever read, regardless of their position on the issue, not once did I read someone say, and by the way, they are already serving as soldiers in the army. This was to be a step in a brand new direction, and one that people like Hal Cobb, again, understood potentially could ruin the Confederacy. It's not until Robert E. Lee backs this plan, I think in January of 1865, that Davis comes around and a number of other people come around. The Confederate Congress debates it, and in mid-March of 1865, uh, within just a few weeks of Confederate surrender in the spring of 65, uh, they passed barely passed legislation authorizing the enlistment of black men. But of course, within a few weeks, Lee's army surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, and within weeks, the rest of the Confederate armies surrender as well. Uh, so it never takes hold. The policy uh, gets as far as the legislation. Uh, roughly two companies are raised in Richmond. Uh, they are housed in a prison. Uh, there, doesn't, there's little evidence to suggest they were given weapons, which gives you a sense of how much they were trusted. And there's no evidence that they actually saw the battlefield during those final weeks. The war ends for the Confederacy as it began, a war, a white man's war, intended to maintain the institution of slavery um, and white supremacy. Okay? That's how the war ends. No one is under any illusion that large numbers, or even a couple hundred black men, had already uh, fought as soldiers at some point during this period. Uh, you can see, of course, Northern newspaper having some fun at this debate. Uh, many Northerners believe once you suit up these black Confederate soldiers and they see the battlefield, at least according to Harper's Weekly, what's going to happen, uh, they are immediately going to drop their weapons and run to the Union Army. Okay? So that's how the war ends. I should uh, mention uh, that Silas uh, is w stays with Andrew until Andrew's wounding at the Battle of Chickamauga in September of 1863. Uh, Silas escorts Andrew home back to West Point. Uh, Silas uh, has a family back home. He has a newborn uh, baby back home in West Point, uh, as well as a wife. And so, of course, he is also uh, very interested in getting back home. Less than a year later, Andrew's brother goes off to war uh, by the name of Benjamin. He serves in a Mississippi cavalry unit and what's interesting about this unit is they are one of the units that escorts Davis, President Davis, out of Richmond once it falls in early April. Um, and the unit is with Davis up until his capture in Georgia by the Union Army. So Silas is literally with the Confederate Army from almost day one until almost the very, the very last days of the life of the Confederacy. Now what happens after the war is, is, really, is also quite interesting. Um, these... These camp slaves, these body servants, uh, they maintain an important place within this growing sort of lost cause narrative of the Civil War that defeated Confederates uh, developed to rationalize what the war is about. Uh, they argue in a uh, post-65 period, they argue that slavery wasn't the cause of the war. Uh, they argue that if the only reason they lost was because of uh, the uh, war material and the uh, numbers in the North. Their cause itself, the Confederate cause, remained righteous. It remained a moral cause. And of course, generals like Stonewall Jackson depicted here and Robert E. Lee remained the great Christian warriors of the Confederacy. But at the center of this lost cause narrative is the loyal slave. And you see it here, depicted here in this uh, illustration, Stonewall Jackson in camp. And you can see the Jackson's uh, right. You can see the body servant. 
standing loyally by his side. So these kinds of illustrations, uh, I'll show you another one um, a couple years later, that depict Confederates with camp slaves was quite common. And again, uh, throughout the post-war period, uh, these men, these black men, are, are understood as enslaved men. Again, no one is under any kind of illusion uh, that we're looking at black soldiers. And you can see one sort of uh, dozing off by the tent, and you can see, of course, a group of men, black men and women, um, in the background there preparing food. So these, would have, these were fairly accurate depictions of Confederate camps uh, during the war. And you'll find references to these enslaved men in you know, reminiscences, newspaper articles, um, all kinds of post-war writing. Uh, these men are right there at the center because they are a reminder to defeated Confederates that their enslaved population always remained loyal. So we're going to forget about stories of, of camp slaves running off for their freedom during the war. They are going to sort of um, massage the evidence, uh, if you will, and just focus on those things that will help them pick up the pieces um, after this decisive defeat in 1865. A little bit later, uh, toward the end of the 19th century, uh, Confederate veterans hold numerous reunions, national reunions, local reunions, uh, and it was very common to find former camp slaves, former body servants attending these functions. They would have attended for any number of reasons. Um, although it's difficult to get at motivation for lack of, a, of the historical record, but you know we can we can sort of assume a number of things. It's probably safe to assume that some of these men believe that attending these reunions uh, will reinforce perhaps their status back home. Uh, it might gain certain favors uh, from Confederate veterans who, of course, during the post-war period, um, occupy any number of leadership positions, both locally, statewide, and even nationally. So attending, showing uh, that you remain loyal to the cause uh, at these veterans' reunions may have benefited these men. I also don't doubt that some of these former camp slaves hope to rekindle, perhaps, some of the relationships that they had developed during the war. That may be difficult to hear, uh, but I am convinced that during the war um, that there were probably some moments of genuine other concern between camp slave and master. And I am, I, I'm sort of cautious about making that point because we always have to remember that we're talking about the master-slave relationship. But remember that both the parties uh, were away from home, away from families. They experienced some of the same hardships, whether it had to do with weather, uh, lack of food, and some of the most, um, I would say some of the closest moments, perhaps, uh, come about as the result of disease. I found a number of accounts of, of camp slaves taking care of their master and vice versa. Now, again, we've got to keep in mind that we're talking about the master-slave relationship. And so I don't want to assume too much because you're always looking at these experiences, these relationships through the lens of the master. There's very little documentation from these enslaved men. And so I, I want to be very cautious about what I assume was the case in these relationships. Uh, a number of them are very prominent during the post-war period. Jefferson Shields, uh, he attends numerous reunions uh, during this period, and you can see that if you look very closely, you'll see he's wearing any number of Confederate reunion uh, ribbons on his chest. Um, so these men, um, some of them earn money at these events, and so there's a lot going on. There's, it's, it's an interesting uh, dynamic at work here at these reunions. Uh, the most interesting uh, former camp slave is Steve Eberhardt Perry. Um, he is absolutely fascinating for a number of reasons from Georgia. Uh, his master's surname was Eberhardt, and that is the surname that he uses uh, or used when he attended the reunions. Outside of the reunions, he used Perry, as did his wife and children, which suggests to me that Eberhardt may have understood the role he was playing at these reunions, that he understood, like other body servants, that they were there to reinforce that lost cause narrative. They were there as part of a show, Right? Uh, and perhaps adopting that, that surname may have been a way of distancing himself from what he was doing. I can't say that for sure. It's certainly one possibility. 
the reason they are so important to these events is because they are a reminder of the antebellum racial status quo. So during or post reconstruction, white southerners, their challenge is to maintain white supremacy as we make our way to the end of the 19th, early 20th century. You've got, of course, a new generation, especially African American, that never experienced slavery. They are pushing for civil rights. Some of them, of course, are pushing for it still within the Republican Party. And so to have these men attend these reunions is a reminder of what white Southerners would have expected from the black population. This is how you should behave. And there will be consequences for those African Americans who don't behave this way, who are not deferential to the white authorities. And many of these men seem to have understood that. In fact, what's interesting is Eberhardt uh, was very vocal uh, when he attended these reunions. And I'm going to read you, so get to it. So one reunion, Eberhardt, here's what he said. I shall ever remain in my place. He's talking to a white audience. I shall ever remain in my place and be obedient to all the white people. I pray that the angels may guard the homes of all Rome, meaning Rome, Georgia, and the light of God shine upon them. And he went on to say, I have always been a white man's, and then he uses the N-word. And the Yankees can't change me, sir, exclamation point. So it's a, it's a very effective sort of example of, of sort of giving these, white, these, these large white audiences what they expect to hear from these elderly former camp slaves. And these reunions continue into the early 20th century. This one from Tampa in the 1920s. You can see Steve Eberhardt. He is seated fourth from the left. He's wearing that wonderful hat. You can see he's sort of got all these ribbons. He's holding a Confederate battle flag. If you go two more to the right, you'll see a, a man with a hat wearing a white, what appears to be a white ribbon. If you, um, if you blow this up, get, get in close, the ribbon clearly says ex-slave. So again, the point here being that no one was confused about the status of these men during the war. No one is debating whether black men fought as soldiers in the Confederate Army. The memory of the war, when it comes to African, African Americans in the Army, is as enslaved men, impressed slaves, or as body servants. I'm going to keep going here. Uh, to give you a sense of how sort of common this image of the body servant was, this is from a New York newspaper from 1920, uh, selling uh, a new modern washing machine. And of course, you've got Robert E. Lee selling it, right? I mean, he's being, you can see him clearly depicted here. And then of course, to, his, to the right, you can see, of course, the body servant cleaning his socks, right? So throughout the 20th century, this is the dominant narrative. And even in the monuments, that we see during this crucial period between 1880 and 1920, uh, when it comes to depicting African Americans in the Confederate Army, they are as enslaved men. A couple examples, and just to sort of remind you that the image of the loyal slave uh, was everywhere, right? I mean, even here in D.C. in the 1920s, Congress was debating whether to dedicate a national monument on the Mall to the loyal mammy. Uh, I mean we can be grateful that that never happened. Uh, but here you can see some of the models that were considered here. Uh, but the camp slave specifically also is the focus of attention when it comes to some of these monuments. Small and much more and much larger. And again, remember, you know, when you depict African Americans during this period as loyal slaves, think about how that reinforces the Jim Crow hierarchy. If African Americans were never interested in their freedom, if they were always loyal to master in the Confederacy, well then of course they don't deserve full civil rights. We don't have to treat them as full citizens. Controlling the historical narrative becomes a way to control the present, to control the racial status quo in the Jim Crow South. Another one dedicated to the faithful slaves, in Fort Mill, South Carolina. And then the most interesting one is right here across the river, the Potomac in Arlington National Cemetery. 
dedicated in 1914 by the UDC, uh, marks the graves of roughly 365 Confederate dead that were reinterred from area cemeteries to Arlington. Uh, Woodrow Wilson helped with the dedication of this monument. Today you'll find it on hundreds of websites as evidence that blacks fought as soldiers in the army, in large part because of two uh, images. First, you can see the loyal mammy on the right. So we do in this area, if you consider Northern Virginia part of the D.C. Right? Uh, area, we have a loyal mammy monument. And it's in the middle of Arlington National Cemetery. She's taking, of course, the child from the Confederate officer. But if you look over to the left, you'll see what appears to be a black man with a kepi in a Confederate uniform. And for many people, that is evidence of black Confederate soldiers. But it's not. In fact, no one was confused during the dedication that this was, in fact, a body servant. In fact, this little passage is from the UDC's official history of the monument. And as far as they were concerned, you can see how they describe it. On the right is a faithful Negro body servant following his young master, right? I'm going to skip this slide. I just, I, well, real fast, this is, of course, from my hometown right now of Boston. It does give you a sense of how important sort of a, a more honest depiction of black men is uh, or, or would have been uh, at the turn of the 20th century, dedicated in 1897. It is the only monument to black Union soldiers uh, in this country up until uh, roughly the 1990s. So think about the importance of who is remembered, who is forgotten, and if they're remembered, how they're remembered, quite often distorted, mythologized. So when does this change? It changes relatively recently. Changes roughly in the 1970s. This is a little uh, game I played back about 10 years ago with Ngram from Google. You can plug in keywords and get a sense of when they begin to appear. And when it comes to black Confederates, right, as a reference, uh, it really doesn't begin, uh, you don't begin to see it until the 1960s and 70s. Um, it's really the 1970s specifically where this starts. And I was able to pinpoint it, uh, pretty much pinpoint it to the success of the television miniseries Roots, which aired in 1977. It was the first time a large white audience across the country uh, was exposed to a much darker depiction of slavery uh, and emancipation uh, during the Civil War. And it gained the attention of the sons of Confederate veterans. And they were concerned that this negative portrayal of slavery, of the Confederacy, would make it more difficult for them to defend their Confederate ancestors. At this point in time, black Union soldiers are beginning to get more attention. Historic sites are focusing on slavery, emancipation a bit more. And of course, the scholarship is beginning to filter down, which is now really focused on emancipation and even black Union soldiers. So what the SCV is interested in doing coming out of this is finding their own black Confederate soldiers. And they find them, in many cases, they go back to body servants like Silas, Burrell, and others who are wearing uniforms, and they begin to present them not as slaves, but as soldiers. And this sort of takes hold gradually. A lot of it is intentional manipulation. Uh, in the early 1970s, this was published in a Civil War magazine. It looks like Confederate soldiers from the first Louisiana Native Guard. In fact, what you are looking at is a photograph of black Union soldiers taken outside of Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, Camp William Penn in 1864. And at some point later, it was photoshopped because you would have seen white officers on both sides. Uh, they did something with the, the grain of the photograph itself slapped on First Louisiana Native Guard uh, and a few other things on different versions and published it. You can now, of course, find this on hundreds of websites. So some of it, a lot, all of it, I, I would argue, at least early on with the SCV and others, is a kind of intentional manipulation. Um, and this narrative really doesn't take hold until the, the introduction of the internet. Up until that, this is a conversation that is fairly narrow, you know, isolated to the SCV and a few others. But once the internet comes around as a place where we're going to consume history and do history, because anyone, of course, can publish on the internet, uh, that's a game changer. Because what we're not doing in our schools, 
is we're not teaching teachers and we are certainly not teaching students how to properly assess uh, first search uh, online information and assess what these search engines deliver. And you see that most clearly in a case of our Virginia past and present in 2011, where you have a Virginia textbook delivered to all Virginia fourth graders. And it just so happened that a professor at William & Mary had a daughter uh, in the fourth grade, and she wanted to see what it said about the Civil War. And when she opened it, she learned that there were thousands of Southern blacks who fought in the Confederate ranks with Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. When asked where she found this information, you can probably finish the thought here, right, the sentence. She found it after doing a Google search and came upon a Sons of Confederate Veterans website. So the Internet has given this, uh, given this new life. It's made it part of sort of Civil War memory, if you will, right? Uh, I found it in National Park Service exhibits. I have found it in other textbooks um, in, in numerous places. Um, and, it, and in large part, it, it, you can trace it back to the Internet. Uh, it's become part of sort of the popular culture of the Civil War. You can find these men depicted in any number of Civil War paintings, if you want to call them paintings, just you know, these prints. Uh, it's also, interestingly enough, attracted the attention of a small number of African Americans um, for any number of reasons. Perhaps the best known is a man by the name of H.K. Egerton, uh, former NAACP chapter president, uh, who, who is now the darling of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Uh, he's best known for taking long marches in his Confederate uniform and flag. Uh, he does this for a number of reasons. Some of it, I think, he, certainly there's a monetary um, you know, reason behind it. He does get paid for what he does. He has a line of T-shirts from a company called Dixie Outfitters. Um, but he has also at times expressed uh, this desire to to remember a time when race relations were not so divisive. And I, I'll take his word at that. Um, you know, I think he's, he's certainly an entertainer. Um, but then again, you, you meet these people uh, and you find that the way they come to understand the history and gain meaning from that history is very diverse, falls on all places along a spectrum. And so I think it is important to sort of listen uh, as much as possible to the way that people, including all of us in this room, go about making meaning of our lives based in part on the history. I'm going to skip a couple things here just for time's sake, but this is Maddie Rice Clyburn. Her father was a body servant, uh, and she was interested at some, at some point in the past, she was interested in learning more about him. Uh, the SCV found out about this in North Carolina, and they were more than willing uh, to share their preferred narrative of her father, who was an enslaved man, was a camp slave. Uh, according to the SCV, he was, in fact, a soldier. In fact, the SCV held a military-style uh, event to rededicate a historical, a military-style gravestone, excuse me, for Weary Clyburn. She attended that event. And when Maddie died in 2014, the SCV held a military-style funeral for what they refer to as a real daughter of the Confederacy. So African Americans, a small group, um, also have been um, have embraced this Black Confederate narrative for a number of reasons. The last few years, it has certainly reared its head uh, any number of times in the wake of the roof uh, murders in Charleston and the lowering of the Confederate flag in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, the SCV came out with a statement in response to it. And they were very clear about their position on all of this. Um, here was their statement, the SCV in South Carolina. Historical facts show there were black Confederate soldiers. These brave men fought in the trenches beside their white brothers, all under the Confederate battle flag. Uh, the point being that, you know, once those images of Ruth waving a Confederate battle flag, that caused the lowering of the flags. The SCV, in essence, was saying uh, this has nothing to do uh, with race, with slavery, uh, because the Confederacy, in fact, employed black men as equals on the battlefield. They fought as soldiers beside uh, their white brothers. So you can see the politics of it all continuing to play out in uh, response to what happened in Charleston. And then again in Charlottesville in 2017, 
uh, within a few months two Republican state senators in South Carolina, once again South Carolina, uh, proposed dedicating a monument to South Carolina's black Confederate soldiers on the grounds of the state capitol in Columbia. That never gained traction, but that they were willing to vocalize it, to just announce their support of this, uh, gives you a sense that at least some of their constituents are in favor uh, or would have supported such a measure. But it does, again, I'm going to end here, uh, it does sort of speak to the hold of the black Confederate narrative specifically uh, in terms of our discussion, our public debate about how to remember uh, the American Civil War. But I think it also speaks to just the continued difficulty that we have mainly as white Americans uh, in coming to terms with the history of slavery and race in the United States. And with that, I'm going to take your questions if you have any. But thanks so much for, uh, for listening. Appreciate it. I think there are a microphone that's going to go around. Um, so don't be shy. Thanks for all your work. Um, my secondary question is how do you stay so even-tempered through all of this? But the primary one is we've just come to the sesquicentennial. According to the National Park Service, attendance at all the major Civil War battlefields seems to be going down. But by the same token, we're almost at the point of killing each other over the memory of the Civil War. How, do you, how are we processing this as a country? <clears throat> um, not well. I think that's the, the easy way to... Um to respond, uh, it, I think what you're getting at, it's a complex question. Uh, I mean, as an educator, one of the things that I'm encouraged by is I see much more willingness on the part of, um, of, of a younger generation uh, to sort of deal with these tough issues. And, I, and I've worked with students you know, all over the country on the monument issue specifically, and they're really curious about it, and they're very willing to sort of engage around the tough questions. I think a lot of the, the difficulty comes with, um, you know, with, with older Americans who have been taught a very different narrative of American history, one that uh, either downplays or ignores the issue of slavery and race, or you know, to some extent it's distorted right, in, 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 in obvious ways. Um, I think one of the other things that makes it so difficult right now is that so often it's difficult to unwind the history from the politics. The history, is because, history has always been politicized, there's no, no doubt about that, uh, but certainly over the last couple of years, uh, it's become much more difficult to have, well, I mean, a discussion about anything. First, I mean, right, forget about history for a minute, um, but especially history because it's all, quite often and quite early on in the discussion, you, you realize, we're not really talking about history. We're, we're talking about politics and, and sort of the current racial divide. Um, and history can certainly inform that, but we never, we, we quite often don't get there, uh, you know, in, in our dialogue. So, I mean, I'm optimistic as, a, as an educator because I see what's happening in the classroom. Um, but the media certainly enjoys sort of focusing on those hot button issues, and I, and I think that's Part of the other, that's part of the problem as well. But um, you're asking the right question, and I don't have any easy answers. I mean, I, I wish I did. Uh, yeah. uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, you're welcome. My, I have two questions. Um, one is, uh, what in your research did you find about the experience of free blacks in the Confederate South during the war? And then my second question is um, specifically about Lee and um, particularly towards the end of the war with um, Appomattox, uh, what did you find about um, enslaved African Americans uh, to, you know, towards the end uh, with, with Lee's uh, campaign? Yeah. So in terms of free African Americans, I mean, one thing to keep in mind in 1861 is that free blacks in the Confederacy are in a very precarious situation. Uh, you know, they're not quite sure, especially those, those African Americans who have accumulated some wealth, especially in places like New Orleans, the Creole community, but also in places like Petersburg, Virginia. And so you find some of these free blacks are offering their services to the Confederacy early in the war. That has led some people, 
to conclude that, in fact, this is another example of just black loyalty to the Confederacy, when, in fact, perhaps something much more complex was going on. Uh, these are African Americans who are trying to preserve what little they have as free blacks. And in places like Georgia, remember, uh, there's talk bef in the years toward the end of the 1850s, you know, there was talk about uh, returning free blacks into slavery. So, you know, again, they are in a very difficult position. Um, the, free blacks would also have been hired by the Confederacy to perform certain jobs, uh, you know, both in terms of you know, mechanical positions, you know, any, anything that, um, that would have you know, involved utilizing a, a skill, a trade of some kind, which many of them, of course, had. Um, they're also functioning or performing roles in the armies uh, as well. Uh, some of them are being paid as cooks in the Confederate Army, uh, medical staff or medical support. So there are a number of other jobs that they're performing as well, and they're being paid. Sometimes they even appear on regimental muster rolls. And that has also, I think, confused people into thinking that, in fact, they were soldiers, when, in fact, they were being listed perhaps for some other reasons. Um, but they're you know, not a large population. I mean, I think, if I remember correctly, what, roughly, is it, what, 250,000? Or maybe 500,000 total? Um, no, I'm sure it's smaller than that. I have to go back and, and refresh my memory. So it's a small population that would have um, attempted, to, attempted to, again, shore up their position in any number of ways. Oh, the other question about Appomattox. Um, okay, so I don't know how many body servants uh, would have been with Lee at Appomattox by the end. There are a number of accounts from the Appomattox campaign where it does seem as though um, Union soldiers are coming into contact with body servants um, as they are pushing against Lee's retreat in various places coming out of Petersburg. Um, I also have a sense that after Gettysburg, uh, Confederate officers and others who are bringing these men, these camp slaves, with them uh, aren't, aren't, doing them, or aren't bringing them in the same numbers. And I think in part because it, there's an increasing concern that these men, in fact, will run off to the enemy. And so there's a concern about protecting their, their property. But, I, but, but that was difficult to really nail down during the research. So that's the best I can do. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for your talk and your book, which I look forward to reading thanks. with enthusiasm. Um, you start by the really solid recognition of, of the mobilization of the slave population in service of war aims. But I was recently reading Stephanie McCurry's um, Confederate Reckoning, yeah, and, and could you comment on some problems with, with doing that and what their sources might be? Uh, with doing so? Mobilizing the black population for Confederate war aims. Well, I mean, the one obvious problem is that they're being mobilized around the assumption that these men are going to be loyal to the Confederate war effort, right? Uh, so that's an extension of the, of the loyal slave narrative itself that, that, that precedes the war. Um, and that becomes difficult to manage, as many of them find out, especially these officers who are bringing these men into camp, because they are, by the middle of the war, running off in larger numbers. Uh, the Union armies, especially along the Mississippi by 1862, are moving into, into the deepest parts of the Confederacy. So they are also disrupting the Confederate war effort in any number of places. And in the process, they're liberating, of course, you know, many enslaved uh, men, women, families um, as well. And so you know, by the middle of the war, I, I, you, know, you begin to see Confederates come to terms with the fact that slavery is beginning to unravel as a result of the war. The very thing that they thought would preserve slavery, in other words, secession itself, and perhaps you know, um, trying for independence, fighting for independence, is the very thing that, in fact, undercuts the institution of slavery. And, and that's, a painful, that's a painful process of, or a painful realization for many of them, especially during the debate in 1864-65. It's, it's emotional because they were very, I think, clear about what it would mean to, to the Confederacy moving forward. Okay, maybe you gain some extra months. Maybe even imagine gaining independence. For what? If you don't have slavery, what was it all for? What was all of the sacrifice for? Um, so it's, um, 
it's extremely difficult for them to sort of articulate the, the, the idea that, that roughly four million enslaved people are a strength to the Confederacy, when in fact, from the beginning, they have, there's all kinds of evidence that it's not. It's, it's, it's unraveling around them. I hope that answered your question. It did. Okay, okay. good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> usually, uh, when people talk about creating a fiction afterward, um, the response would be to look at contemporary records. Uh, for military, you typically would look at pension records, or in, the, in some cases, the people that went to the old soldiers' homes. Were blacks, Confederates, uh, blacks in the South, were, did they show up on pension rolls if they uh, existed in the South? And did they get equal access to the old soldiers' you, homes? You will definitely need to read the book. Um, <laughs> no, there, there's, thanks for the question. There's an entire chapter on, on pensions. And again, th the reason I devoted an entire chapter is because uh, there are many people today who will argue uh, that these pension records are evidence that these black men fought as soldiers. When in fact, all you have to do is look at the documents themselves. The documents actually tell you what they're for, right? And they are for former camp slaves. Virginia, of the five states that issued pensions, Virginia was the broadest. Virginia would give you a pension if you're a body servant or an impressed slave. So there was a, a wider latitude there um, for those men. Uh, four of the five in the 1920s, and again, uh, a relatively small number were, you know, were able to take advantage because, of course, by the 1920s, many of them uh, had died off. And when you look at the records, uh, again, it's very clear of, in, in terms of who they were given for, or given to, you know, former, formerly enslaved men, body servants. Um, they were expected in their responses to tow the lost cause line. So they were asked to, you know, to indicate um, the regiment your master served in, uh, they would sometimes give you room to talk about your wartime experience, which was also interesting. Some of them, of course, uh, or many of them, uh, talk about being uh, very close to Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, even if they were not in the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, but again, I mean, they are, they're, they're making a claim to, to much needed money uh, from, yeah, at this point in time for many of these men. So whatever it takes, um, only a couple thousand were, were issued. And again, it's because... Um, these men were at the end of their lives, and so uh, they just were not able to take advantage of this legislation. But the legislation itself also reinforced the lost cause and uh, Jim Crow society at that point in time, because it's another way for the state government uh, to sort of to reinforce the kind of behavior that they expect from the from African Americans. And remember, the 1920s, black men are coming back wearing their uniforms and carrying the rifles that they used in Europe to help make Europe safe for democracy. And when they come back home, many of them get off those trains in southern towns and cities wearing those uniforms. Many of them are met with violence, and some of them are, in fact, lynched. And so to have the contrast between the newly arrived veteran of Europe, right, U.S. veteran, contrasting that with the elderly uh, black man who fought, or fought, sorry, who was present as a body servant, the loyal slave, that's really all you need, right? It sent a very clear message. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I was in, intrigued by this topic as it fits into the, the larger narrative of what the Civil War was and was not about. Yes. Um, to me, it, it defies logic that the Civil War was not about slavery and that there's a story that people fought side by side in inequality. You alluded earlier to saying you thought it related to politics. I, I think it, and I just want your opinion on this, mm -hmm. I think it's more about patriotism and how as Americans we just want to be patriotic and we buy into the narrative that we are the greatest country and we built democracy and that because of that, yeah. it's uncomfortable to think that we fought a war to enslave people, which included physical violence and sexual violence. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I think you make a really good point. And, and, and let me sort of try and answer that from a slightly different angle, because I think you can make the same point in reference to um, looking at this from the perspective of the United States during the Civil War. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, slavery 
was not on its way out. It was not dying in 1860. In fact, the value of enslaved uh, men and women was never higher uh, in 1860, 61. And as many of you know, the war is not being fought early on to end slavery. It's being fought to save the Union. The vast majority of the loyal citizenry of the United States did not go off to war in 1861 to free slaves. It certainly did not go off to war to make black people equal to white people. And I think that is what, and let me just add one other point. The war could have ended with slavery intact. If the war ends before January 1st of 1863, the Union is saved and slavery is still intact. Damaged, definitely, but it's still intact in many places. And the reason I think it's important to sort of go into it with that perspective is because I think, you know, we, we tend to think, well, look, it's just the Confederate heritage people who are uh, having difficulty wrapping their heads around racism and white supremacy and slavery during the Civil War and, and, and moving forward. But I would argue, and I think you're alluding to this, is I would argue that Americans generally have difficult coming to terms with the, the, the legacy of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, you know, that, that at its root was the issue of white supremacy, that, that even coming out of the war for the United States, very few people are interested, as I, as I said, in, in, in racial equality. That slavery ended is what Americans have to somehow come to terms with, white Americans, for the next 150 years. They try a little bit in, during Reconstruction. And it's incredible what happens during Reconstruction. I don't think we should downplay uh, the accomplishments of Reconstruction. But we know, of course, what happens as a result of it. We know, of course, sort of the dark years of Jim Crow. Um, but, but it seems to me that that's what we are still trying to wrap our heads around in this country, right? You end slavery, not because we came to some moral moment or clar moment of clarity, but because the war dragged on. And if you're going to save the Union, you have to recruit black men. But once you put black men in uniform, then you've got to deal with the consequences of that. Okay, what rights do they deserve as a result? Once you free four million people, what does freedom in fact mean? And that becomes, that, be, that is our debate in 2019 still in large part, given everything that's happened in between. Civil rights, all of that, I want to acknowledge all of that. But that's still what we're dealing with. And I will just, I'll end with this. It has certainly been clarified over the last couple of years, that that is our issue, the racial divide, that we probably, we perhaps have not come as far as we think we have. I hope that gets yeah. at your question. Just as an interesting side note, about a month ago during the discussion about reparations, Mitch McConnell said on tape, we fought an entire war over slavery. That caught me off guard, but that was just an interesting point. <laughs> he says a lot of things. Hi. Uh, well. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a fairly specific question. You've kind of touched on the edges of this a little bit. Um, but I'm really interested in how the Union Army, when they encountered these camp slaves, um, especially since, as you mentioned, the Union was publishing that these were soldiers, did the Union Army, did they treat them as prisoners of war? Were they given the opportunity to become refugees and follow the Union Army, as so many did? How, yeah. how does the Union interpret so certainly these so certainly fugitive slaves generally who come into contact with the Union Army right. uh, you know some of them remain in the army and function as something equivalent to a, a body servant right. uh, there's a wonderful account from Fredericksburg um, that David Blight edited it's about mm -hmm. a slave named John Washington who, who um, ends up spending some time with a New York regiment um, after he crosses the Rappahannock in the spring of 62 um, Many of these men, of course, families, black families generally that escape slavery and cross into Union lines end up in contraband camps. Right. Um, and there's a lot of really recent, uh, really good recent research on contraband camps. Um, and it certainly complicates our, our narrative, that narrative that we tend to want to tell ourselves, that narrative of slavery to freedom, that there's a middle point between slavery and freedom that was incredibly complex, disease-ridden, uh, violence, uh, it wasn't an easy transition for many uh, former slaves who are now contraband. To get at your, your other question about um, when the Union Army comes into contact with the Confederate Army, I, you know, and, and 
what did they have to say about these black men who were with the Confederate Army? I honestly didn't come across that much. Okay. But then again, a lot of the material I was looking at was Confederate. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't spend that much time with, um, on that side, on the Union side. And perhaps I should have. But that, I think, is a, that, that actually would be an interesting research project. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Kevin. Um, Hi. I'm, I'm Brian Cheeseboro. I think you know I've followed your blog nice for you. quite a few years yeah. and, and really appreciate it. And uh, just finished your book. Um, it's really good. Thanks. Um, I wanted to say, one, that uh, you mentioned about the Chandler photograph uh, being, I guess, in a studio. Uh, it's also possible uh, that sometimes those uh, photographers would take their studio out into the field. Um, you know, as opposed to a brick and mortar or a wooden nails building. Absolutely. So that's also, maybe that's where the weapons could have come from or something. Just want to mention that. Yeah. But the I'll, other I'll, thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the other thing um, is, no, um, that um, just a question about, about how the war had been remembered or the lost cause came about. I always hear from historians that, uh, and I'm wondering what your take on this is, that, um, well, Former Confederates knew that they didn't want to be on the wrong side of history by saying the war was about slavery and so on and so on. Like Jim Crow, lynchings, segregation, or whatever would make them look good. <laughs> I, this is the one thing that I always hear historians say that, you know, well, they didn't want to be remembered for fighting for slavery. But very few people say much about uh, how what actually happened in terms of, of, of that memory. I hope that makes sense um, and what your take on that might be. No, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> it's an interesting point. I'm always struck by similar comments um, you know, from people who are convinced that these men, in fact, served loyally as soldiers. And then you sort of ask them, so then explain Jim Crow to me. Like, it, it, was this somehow, or explain the Klan right? Explain racial terrorism, the violence in, in the 1860s and 70s. Um, and they're never quite, you know, able to do that. So I think consistent, consistency is, is almost always lacking in, in, in some of these responses. I'm not quite sure. I, I'm, I'm sort of fully getting the memory question that you're, that you're, you're getting after here. Um, I, I guess, um, I think with, uh, they wanted slavery to continue. And I think uh, when would it end? That. I mean, they, they wanted their, their children, their grandchildren, to, be, to benefit from slavery. Absolutely. Um, having somebody do something for them. But that didn't happen, and it's like, I guess, a sour grapes thing. Well, I didn't really want that. I wanted something else. Yeah. But, but just uh, um, w in terms of historians, how we talk about this, that I, very, I hear very few people say anything about... Um, what am I trying to say? It's just that, that um, I don't know. Maybe you should go ahead. Yeah, no, no. Um, I think the sour grapes argument is, is interesting, but I don't know if it gets us that far. I think his, what, what historians are, are looking at is you know, how, how do these narratives function in the post-war period? Why are white Southerners um, so committed to... Um, to first of all, telling themselves these stories about what the war was about, um, but also, and I get, this gets us to the monuments more specifically, uh, and the reunions, because those events are all about imparting those narratives to the next generation. So, I, I, so, so the lost cause to me, you know, it, a lot of that you can trace to the pre-war period. The loyal slave narrative is already there, right? It's just that after the war, they're going to talk about the slaves that you know, hid the jewelry in the path of Sherman's march and were loyal to their masters, rescued them on the battlefield. Mm. But where the lost cause really comes into play, it seems to me, is, um, is, is by the 1880s, when you're dealing with a generation that did not experience the war, right? both white and black. And first, for the white generation, uh, they need to be taught. right? And the UDC, as much as we've, we've focused on the issue of monuments, and certainly their work on Confederate monuments is absolutely crucial. Uh, but the most important work the UDC did was controlling history textbooks. Right? You're not using a history textbook in a southern school unless, and even beyond the south in some cases, because there are UDC chapters all over the place. You're not using a history textbook unless it was approved by the UDC. And for it to be approved, it has to say specific things about Lincoln, 
not so nice things. And it has to say certain things about, of course, Lee, the Confederacy, and slavery. So, you know, I guess I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I'm just trying to sort of offer some some perspective here that 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 the lost cause um, that narrative, you know, the role it plays evolves over time. You know, from the very first years of the post-war period, okay. when they're just trying to come to terms with the, the, the dead, right, and 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 finding the dead, right, as both sides were, and then of course, you know, not too long later, uh, you know, using it to maintain white Southern unity, mm -hmm. right, over the generations. Okay. So I don't know if that's really helping in any way, but thanks, I appreciate it. That's all I got. Thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.